So today, we're going to conclude looking at uninformed searches. We've already looked at breadth-first search, but today we'll look at uniform cost search, depth-first search, depth-limited depth search, and iterative deepening search. And we'll also look at searches that are informed by knowledge of the search process itself, uh, which m are more generally called heuristic searches. And uh, we'll look at uh, two kinds of best first search, one called greedy search, and then the other, which is sort of the classic search called A star. We'll look a little bit at defining admissible heuristics, and we'll take a look at relaxed problems in order to create admissible heuristics. So let's begin with uniform cost search. So here the idea is that um, instead of uh, in breadth first search expanding the oldest node first, we're going to expand the least cost unexpanded node. What's the cost? Well, if it's if there is no cost metric, um, then in other words, well, all the co the cost of every step is the same. Then it's equivalent to breadth first search. Um, if you have a way of defining the cost, though, uh, then you can order it in terms of cost. So, for instance, in the uh, getting to Bucharest example, uh, the cost would be the mileage, total mileage to get to the state we're in. So, um, let's find out the characteristics of uniform cost search. So, is it complete? Can we reach all the states? And yes, um, if the uh, step cost is greater than or equal to epsilon. Time, uh, well, it's the number of nodes with where the uh, G, our metric, is less than or equal to the cost of the optimal solution. Um, and uh, it's order of uh, B to the C, upper bound of C star divided by epsilon where C star is the uh, uh, cost of the optimal solution. Space, basically the same. Optimal, yes, because the nodes are expanded in increasing order of G of N. So since we look at the lowest cost nodes first, the solution we're going to find is going to be, by definition, the lowest cost solution. So next, let's turn to depth-first search. It's basically the same mechanism as breadth-first and uniform cost, except that instead of expanding the oldest expanded node first, we uh, expand the deepest or newest expanded node, unexpanded node. So um, where in breadth-first search, when we implemented it, we used a queue, that is, first in, first out data structure uh, for the fringe. In depth first search, we use a stack that is last in, first out. So to illustrate, um, let's say we have this search tree and we're going to have our uh, uh, start state be A and it turns out that we're looking for a solution uh, that's going to have the state uh, that, that the node M will have as a state. So. Um, we put A into our stack and, uh, and uh, expand it first. So we've already looked at A, it's not there now, and it's not a solution, so we, we've got B and C on the stack, um, and we could arbitrarily pick B or C because they're the same, uh, uh, expanded from the same node, but we're going to go left to right. So uh, next we'll expand B, and instead of expanding C, which we had, would have done in breadth first search, we'll expand the, uh, expand the newest uh, or deepest node, which would be D, then H, then I. Now, we've looked at all the children of D, which are H and I, so we'll go back up and look at the other child of B, which is E, and then instead of uh, then we'll expand uh, the children of E, which are J and K. Well, J isn't the solution, and K isn't the solution. So that whole subtree uh, of E, J, and K doesn't have a solution. In fact, none none of the nodes under B has a solution. So we'll 
turn to the uh, to the uh, other last unexpanded node in our uh, in our stack, which is C. So we expand C. That gives us F and G. We'll, we're going depth first, so we'll expand F first, and we'll expand L. Uh, we'll take a look at L. It has no children, and then we can take a look at M and re restart our solution. So what are the uh, um, properties of depth first search? Is it complete? Uh, take a minute to think about it. Are we going to be able to reach every state? Um, well, what happens if there are loops and we run into that loop uh, as we uh, go down uh, the depth first part of the tree? Well, that means that no, um, if, the, if we've got an infinite depth space or spaces with loops, um, it's not going to be complete because uh, we could just keep going down the tree until we run out of memory and expanding down and uh, uh, we'll never get back up uh, to find the solution node, which could have been at depth 2, for all we know. Now, the, so what we want to do, of course, to avoid this kind of problem, is make sure that we avoided repeated states along the path, and um, in the implementation we've done a breadth-first search, we already have that, so we're, we should be safe. The, the other thing to note, of course, is that if the search tree is finite, uh, then depth first search is complete because, like in the example I just showed you, um, we reach the maximum depth of our search tree and then start working our way back up. How about time complexity? Well, it's um, o, It's the order of the branching factor to the maximum depth of our search. Now, that could be really, really bad if the maximum depth of our search is a lot larger than the depth D where the solution is. So if we search thousands and thousands of layers down uh, uh, and then work our way back up to discover that the uh, solution was at level was at depth 2, uh, clearly we're not having the optimal uh, uh, time complexity. Um, how about space? Well, here the story is much better. Um, it's uh, the space is on the order of the branching factor times the uh, maximum depth. In other words, it's linear. So uh, compared to um, breadth first search, it's much, much better. How about optimal? Is it going to find the optimal solution? Well, the answer is no, because um, if there was a solution at depth 1,000 and we went all the way down there, we're going to find it uh, before the solution at depth 2 if um, uh, that's the path we took. So that's depth first search. And um, if you think about it, that's the search technique that Prolog uses. So um, the good news about Prolog is that the, it uses linear space. But on the other hand, if we have uh, a loop or something like that, um, we'll ne we may never get to the solution. Well, depth first search doesn't look so good because uh, we may never reach the, um, the solution state. So here's an idea. Why not limit the depth of our search? In other words, we'll use a depth first search and we'll have some depth limit L. So when we reach uh, any node at depth L, uh, we just won't expand them. And that means that we're not going if to uh, have some kind of uh, infinite uh, uh, looping of uh, uh, generating uh, uh, new nodes at depths greater than L, like we might have in depth first search. So um, the idea is that um, uh, we uh, return uh, either a solution or fail, or we report that we reach the cutoff. In other words, uh, it's not that the it's not that the search necessarily failed because we haven't explored the entire state space. It's just that we've reached the depth limit, and so we just check each time to see if the cutoff occurred. Um, if our goal uh, uh, was reached, then we return the node that we that we have found as a solution. Otherwise, um, if we've reached the depth. Uh, uh, limit, then we return cutoff. Otherwise, we expand uh, normally, except that we don't expand any 
uh, nodes be below the cutoff. Now, you might ask reasonably, well, what's the point of limited depth search if we uh, don't know that we're going to reach the goal? I mean, what if the limit is L and the solution is at depth L plus 1 or L plus 2? That's a good question, and it turns out that depth-limited search uh, is extremely useful because we can use it in iterative deepening search. So here's the idea. What we do is we do a series of depth-limited uh, depth searches, starting with depth 0, and then if that doesn't find a solution, then we do another uh, depth limited search at depth one, and then in, if that doesn't find it, we do another depth limited search this time with depth two, and so forth um, until we find the solution. So let's see how that would work. So um, let's say that we've got uh, iterative deepening search, and uh, and we look first at the initial node with uh, at depth zero and it's not the solution. So um, that's okay. We'll just run another uh, depth limited search with the limit is 1. And uh, uh, again, we can expand A. We look at nodes B and C in depth first order. And it turns out that none of them is the solution. So what do we do? Well, we'll do iterative deepening um, uh, with that should be depth two. So um, uh, here we'll try it again. So we do exactly the same kind of thing. We first expand A, we but then we expand and to get B and C. But instead of going immediately to B and to C, we'll expand B because we're doing depth first search. We explore the B subtree. It's not there. We explore the C subtree. It's not there, and we're stuck. No, because we can do iterative deepening with limited equals 3. So s same idea and uh, we'll look at all the nodes. We first expand the B subtree here and just like we did in depth first search the B subtree turns out not to have the solution but we can go back and now start expanding the C subtree and when we expand F, we get nodes L and M, and M turned out to be our solution. So that's um, uh, uh, how iterative deepening search works. So what are the properties of iterative deepening search? Um, are we going to uh, uh, find, be able to find all the states with solutions? And the answer is yes, because um, basically, uh, for any arbitrary uh, depth of solution, as long we can, we will eventually uh, reach it because we keep increasing L. How about time complexity? Well, um, the first level is going to be uh, uh, depth uh, uh, plus one uh, times a branching factor to the zero width, which is one. Uh, depth time branching factor to the first. Depth minus one times branching factor squared and so forth uh, plus uh, branching factor to the D which all of which adds up to O to O of B to the D which you will remember is the same time complexity as uh, breadth first search so it's no worse than breadth first search but here's the cool part the space is only O of B to the D whereas uh, sorry B times D it's linear whereas the space for breadth-first search was O of B to the D. How about optimal? Well, yes, um, if the step cost is 1. And, um, and basically, we can modify this to explore a uniform cost tree. Let's take a look at how this works uh, for, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, space complexity. So the number of nodes generated uh, in an iterative deepening search for a tree with a branching factor of 10 and depth 5, where the solution is the leaf at the very far right bottom. 
Um, well, the, the second, the first level is one, of course. The second level is 50 and 400 and 3,000 and so forth. And that adds up to 123,450 nodes. Now, breadth first search, um, we're going to end up with uh, something like a million one hundred and eleven thousand one hundred. So you can see that the space complexity for breadth first search is much, much bigger. And uh, considering that most solutions are probably um, a lot deeper than depth five, uh, um, the um, exponential uh, 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 cost, space cost for breadth first search is really going to hurt. So Basically, iterative deepening search does better because other nodes at depth D are not expanded. Um, and basically, we can uh, uh, modify breadth first search to apply goal test when the node is generated as opposed to when it's evaluated, uh, when it's um, ex uh, expanded. And uh, that saves, obviously, um, uh, an entire layer. So, looking at all the algorithms we've, we've come across in the last couple of classes, um, breadth first, yes, it's complete um, uh, uh, and it's optimal, but the uh, uh, time and space, uh, uh, the, sp the time complexity is O of B to the D, basically, and space is still B to the D, um, uh, it's pretty bad. Um, Uniform cost search, uh, basically the same as breadth first search. Um, depth first search, unfortunately not complete because you get into uh, uh, a situation where it keeps expanding nodes down and doesn't, doesn't limit and doesn't come back up. The time is a uh, uh, branching factor to the power of uh, the maximum depth we're going to reach. But the space is only b times m, order of b times m. And it's not optimal because we might find a solution at a lower depth when one actually existed at a shallower depth. Depth limited search, well, it's complete if uh, our limit is greater than or equal to the depth at which the solution is found. The time is b to the l. The space is on the order of b times l, but it's not optimal for the same reason that, um, that uh, depth first search isn't. Now, um, uh, iterative deepening, which is the last one we looked at, um, well, it's complete. Yes, we're going we're gonna to find all the solution nodes, uh, uh, a solution node. Um, the time complexity is b to the d. The space is O of b times d. And it's optimal, yes, because uh, we're only going down one level of depth at a time, so we're basically guaranteed to find the shallowest solution. So in general, tree searches um, uh, of this uninformed kind, um, basically they take a problem that is a way of creating new states and the fringe and returns a solution or a failure. Um, every time, um, uh, so we, we, we put the initial uh, uh, state in, into the fringe to start. If the fringe is empty, that means we've looked at all the states and we return a failure. Otherwise, we uh, remove the first node of the fringe and uh, we uh, check to see if that, um, uh, uh, that's the uh, goal state. If it is, we succeed. Otherwise, we uh, uh, expand that state and put all those nodes into the fringe. And the way in which we pull uh, new pull states off the fringe, uh, nodes off the fringe. Um, in other words, is it, is it uh, last in first out? Is it uh, uh, first in first out? That strategy um, uh, is defined by picking the order of node expansion. In other words, last in first out gives us uh, depth first search. First in first out gives us uh, breadth first search. So now we turn to uh, uh, informed search or what's called heuristic search. And the idea is that we use an evaluation function for each node to provide an estimate 
of the desirability. In other words, is this the path we really want? And uh, what we're going to do is expand the most desirable, that is the low the, the node, that is the one that promises us the the uh, the best path in some some respect. So the implementation um, uh, from a, from a sort of mechanical standpoint is quite easy. Uh, the fringe is a queue uh, that's sorted in decreasing order of desirability, so that um, the most desirable uh, node uh, will be taken off the queue first and expanded. Um, the hard part, of course, is coming up with a way of estimating desirability. Well, we're going to take a look at two ways to do that, um, two cases of uh, best first search. And the first of that is going to be greedy search, and uh, which we'll see is not optimal. And then we'll take a look at A star search, which is one of the classic results uh, or techniques in artificial intelligence. Well, we're going to do this in the context of the uh, uh, problem of getting from Arad to Bucharest. And... Um, here are, here's the map annotated with the uh, uh, straight line distances uh, between each city. And with that, we can estimate the straight line distance of getting to Bucharest from any one of those cities. So if we want to go to Arad, uh, for instance, if we went through uh, uh, Timisoara here, we'd be adding up 118, 111, 70, 75, and so forth. Um, and uh, the thing about straight line distance, which is going, going to be particularly good for us, is that um, the straight line distance uh, is guaranteed to be uh, uh, less than or equal to the actual distance. Why do we know that? Well, imagine that the road here from Arad to Timisoara uh, was perfectly straight. In that case, the straight line distance to Bucharest to, from Arad to Timisoara would be 118, and um, and that would be the actual distance. Of course, uh, there is no shorter path than the straight line, and in fact, the road from Arad to Timisoara probably has curves in it. In which case, uh, the road, the actual distance from Arad to Timisoara by car is going to be greater than 118. So we can see that. Uh, the straight line distance um, is guaranteed to be no less than, uh, to be, sorry, uh, uh, no more than the uh, uh, actual distance between two cities. Okay, with that, let's take a look at greedy search. So, um, greedy search uh, uses an evaluation function, a heuristic, and that estimates the cost of getting from our current uh, n to to the closest goal state. Now, in our in our uh, Romania example, we only have one goal state, and so the closest goal is going to be Bucharest. So, um, in our case, uh, the heuristic uh, uh, we're going to use is uh, the straight line distance from any node n to Bucharest. And greedy search expands the node that appears to be closest to the goal. Why do I say appears? Well, because remember that uh, the roads aren't really perfectly straight, and some there might be one with a uh, shorter straight line distance, but which actually took uh, greater mileage. Maybe it went over the mountains, and there are lots of curves, something like that. Okay, so let's see greedy search in action. So we'll start with our uh, initial state of being in a rod, and from a rod... Uh, the estimated uh, straight line distance to Bucharest is 366. So we'll expand that, and we've got uh, three cities we can check, Sibiu, Timisoara, and Zerand. And um, the, uh, it looks like uh, Sibiu here has the shortest estimated straight line distance from, to Bucharest. So greedy, the greedy search will expand Sibiu. And uh, from Sibiu, there are uh, uh, four possible places to go. One is back to Arad, which we're clearly not going to do. Um, the second uh, would be Fagaras, then Oradea, and Ruminichu Lucia. So uh, when we look at the shortest distance, 
Um, Fagaras has the shortest distance of any of our existing nodes, so that's the one we'll expand. And sure enough, uh, we've got a path from Fagaras directly to Bucharest, and the, at that point, um, our heuristic value is zero because the straight line distance from Bucharest to Bucharest is zero. And that's greedy search at work. Um, what are the properties of this sort of search? Well, um, it's not complete because you can get stuck in loops. If you go back to the map, uh, you'll see that if you get to Iasi, you're going to get stuck into a uh, loop uh, between Iasi and Nant. Um Now, if you have a, f a finite space and you check for repeated states, that'll get rid of the loops and uh, it will be complete. How about time complexity? Well, it's order of the branching factor to the maximum depth of your search, uh, but if you've got a good heuristic, you can get much, much better performance. Space, um, same as um, uh, 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 basically the time complexity, uh, and what's more, you've got to keep all the nodes in memory, because you don't know uh, 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 which one you're going to expand next. Is it optimal? Uh, no, because uh, what if the uh, heuristic massively understates the actual cost, uh, then you might take a path which wasn't the optimal path. Well, we can do better than greedy search, and that's the A star algorithm. As I said, it's, it's an absolute classic result in computer science and in artificial intelligence. So the idea is that um, we're going to keep track not only of how much it's going to cost us, we think, to get from where we are to the solution state, but also how much it costs us to get to where we are. So our evaluation function uh, will be uh, the, the total cost of the path. So g of n is the cost it's taken us to get to where we are, our current node. h of n is the same as in the greedy search. It's the estimated cost from uh, to the goal from our n, uh, our current node, and f of n is going to be the sum of those two. It's the estimated total cost of the path uh, from the initial state through this node n to the goal. Now, A star search uses an admissible heuristic, and you know about admissible heuristics because of the homework uh, from last time, um, but just to reiterate, the point of an admissible heuristic is that it, um, h of n, the heuristic, has to be uh, less than or equal to h star, where h star is the true cost from uh, n to the goal. So um, if the road was absolutely straight, h of n would be equal to h star of n, but if there are any, any curves at all, uh, h of n was going to be less than h star of n. Um, so the point is that uh, at least in uh, that, that, that our straight line distance uh, for our, our uh, traveling from Arad to Bucharest program uh, problem is, uh, is uh, that's a good heuristic because it never asked, overestimates the actual road distance. It's, it's an admissible heuristic. And um, you can show that A star search is optimal. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go through the full proof, um, but in a little bit I'll give you a sort of intuitive notion of, of why that has to be the case. So let's take a look at an A star search example, and we'll start in a rod. And so um, our uh, function f of n, uh, the value is 366. Why? Because we're in a rod, so we haven't incurred any cost yet, and the estimated straight line distance uh, 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 from a rod to Bucharest is 366. So that's our current cost, or what we, what we uh, estimate the total cost of getting a rod from a rod to Bucharest is going to be. So we expand that node, and we've got three nodes. Let's take a look at Sibiu here first. Um, uh, it took us 140 kilometers to get from Arad to Sibiu, and we th the straight line distance from Bucharest to Bucharest from Sibiu is 253. So the total cost of getting to where we are now and getting from where we are now to Bucharest is going to be 393. Let's compare that to f of n for Timisoara and Zerant. Well, Sibiu's f of n is less than either of those two, so Sibiu is the goal, is this the node we're going to expand. So we expand that, 
and we uh, have four possible places to go. One is back to a rod, and uh, clearly we're not going to do that because then we're going to have to go from a rod to Sibiu uh, three times, and that gives us a huge cost, so no going back. Um, we could go to Fagaras, Oradea, or Ruminichu Vilcia. And here, Ruminichu Vilcia has the lowest F of N of any of the nodes in the tree so far, including these nodes here. So that's the node we're going to expand. Why? Because when we look at the cost of getting to Ruminichu Vilcia is 220, plus the straight line uh, distance to Bucharest, it adds up to 413, which is the lowest estimated uh, total cost. So let's expand that node. And that gives us uh, uh, three additional nodes. Um, but their total cost is uh, for each one is 526, 417, and 5, 553. And we have another node here, Fagaras, which has a lower estimated total cost than any of those three. So looking at the total costs of all the nodes, uh, we're going to pick Fagaras to expand next. So we expand those, and uh, there's no point in going back to Sibiu, and we can get directly from Fagaras to Bucharest, um, but our total cost is going to be 450. But look, what about Patesi here? Um, there, the cost of getting to Patesi was 317, but Bucharest's straight line distance is only 100 kilometers. So it looks like the total cost of getting from Patesi to Bucharest is less than going from Fagaras to Bucharest. So instead of, ex so instead of uh, finding that we've gotten to the goal here, we realize we have a lower cost path, and instead we expand the node uh, at Patesi, and then, sure enough, we get to Bucharest with a total cost of 418. There was a total added up cumulative straight line distances uh, from Ara to Sibiu, Sibiu, Sibiu to Riminuchu Vilcia, Riminuchu Vilcia to Pitesi, uh, Pitesti, sorry, and Pitesti to Bucharest of 418. We're at Bucharest, so there's no more to go, and the total cost is 418, and that's our lowest cost path, and that's the solution found by A star. So, why is A star optimal? Well, the idea is that A star expands the nodes in order of increasing F value. So we can think of it, uh, the increasing levels of F, as um, equivalent to the increasing depth and breadth first search. So, in, so when in breadth first search, we, uh, assuming uniform cost, uh, we added a new layer uh, um, each time. Uh, here, we're going to be adding a new F contour, that is, uh, a, uh, uh, a new layer associated with some particular level of cost. So our first level of cost is, is from here at a rod, um, and then the next level would be with a rod uh, to Sibiu, and then so forth. So the idea is that um, uh, uh, we expand out uh, cost by cost, and because we uh, expand out cost by cost, uh, our s set of possible solutions uh, uh, states will never include a solution state which is worse than the optimal solution state. And that's in a nutshell, the intuition behind the optimality of A-star search. Let's take a look at the properties of A-star. Is it complete? Yes, um, unless there's infinitely many nodes where uh, uh, our F function is less than or equal to uh, the F function for the goal, uh, which is highly unlikely. How about time complexity? Well, it's exponential in the relative error in H, that is the extent to which H uh, understates the actual cost times the length of the solution path. Space, well, it has to keep all the nodes in memory because we saw uh, we might want to revisit a node that turns out to have a lower, lower cost uh, as things turned out. Is it optimal? Yes. Um, you can't expand 
uh, the uh, nodes with cost f of i plus 1 unless until we've expanded all the nodes with uh, cost f sub i. So basically the idea is that A star expands all the nodes with a uh, 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 function, a cost function uh, for a particular node less than the true cost. It expands some of the nodes with a uh, cost function equal to true cost, and it expands no nodes with a cost function greater than the true cost. So for this last part of today's lecture, uh, we'll look at admissible heuristics. And we're going to focus uh, on admissible heuristics in the context of the eight puzzle. Um, as you'll remember from a prior lecture, an eight puzzle is a sort of two-dimensional version of the three-dimensional Rubik's Cube. Um, you've got these eight numerical tiles that uh, can slide around on the little board and um, uh, they're out of order and the idea is to move them one at a time and put them in the right order. And I actually had one of these when I grew up. So um, let's think about a couple possible heuristic functions uh, for the eight puzzle. Um, and the first one we're going to do is the number of misplaced tiles. So if we compare the start state here and the goal state, we can see, for instance, that, that uh, tile 1 is out of place, tile 2 is in place, tile 3 is out of place, tile 4 is out of place, tile 5 is out of place, tile 6 is in place, and tile 8 is out of place. So all the tiles except 2 and 6 are out of place. So we've got 6 misplaced tiles. So H1 of N would be uh, would be um, uh, uh, would be uh, six. Now, let's look at another heuristic, possible heuristic for this, which is called the Manhattan distance. Now, what's the what's the Manhattan distance? Well, if you're uh, if you have learned anything about this, the uh, borough of Manhattan in the city of New York you know that the blocks are all rectangular. And, uh, and that means that uh, if, you're, uh, if you think of a, any arbitrary uh, rectangle of Manhattan-style blocks, and you start at the lower left-hand corner, and you want to work up to the right-hand corner, it doesn't really matter which path you take, because if you go uh, straight up the left-hand side and then across the top, um, the total distance will be exactly the same as if you went up, uh, the up one block, over one block, up one block, over one block, and so forth, because all of the uh, pieces of path you're going to take are all going to be horizontal or vertical, and all the horizontals will add up to the same amount, and all the verticals will add up to the same amount. So that's called the Manhattan distance. Um, and in our case, um, what we mean is the number of squares away from the desired location of each tile. So let's take a look at tile 1 here. Um, the Manhattan distance for tile 1 for where it should be is 1, 2, 3, 4. I could move it this way, I could move it well this way and so forth, but it's always going to be 4 moves away. So the Manhattan distance for tile 1 is going to be 4. Tile 2, the Manhattan distance is 0 as it's in place. Tile 3, the Manhattan distance is 1, 2, 3. Tile 4, again, the Manhattan distance is 1, 2, 3, and so forth. Tile 5, 1, and so forth. And if we add all those up, we will get a Manhattan distance of 4 for the first, tile 1, 0 for tile 2, 3 for tile 3, 3 for tile 4, and so forth, which adds up to 14. Now, it turns out that both of these um, heuristics are admissible. That is, they both are no greater than the number of actual moves needed to get the tiles in order. And the question I want to think about, just for a minute here, is which of these heuristics is going to be better for a uh, search 
uh, say, an A star search, um, that is going to solve the Manhattan, uh, solve the 8 puzzle. Now, you might think that because H1 has a lower cost here, um, it's the better heuristic. But in fact, it works the other way. Remember that when we were talking about um, the uh, A star algorithm, the cost of the search um, depended on how much the uh, heuristic underestimated the actual cost of the path. So a, a, a heuristic, even if admissible, or it's particularly admissible, I suppose, uh, if it understates the actual cost a lot, um, we're uh, likely to um, uh, have a more costly search. So what we want to find is a heuristic that uh, states the cost as high as possible, but without going over the actual cost. And that's what's called, in our case, one heuristic dominating another. So if you have two heuristics, uh, H1 uh, and H2, and they're both admissible, uh, uh, if the cost, if, if H1's estimated cost is less than or equal to H2's estimated cost for all nodes, then we say that H2 dominates H1. That is, H2 has a uh, cost that's higher and thus closer to the actual cost uh, for all node n. So let's see how much uh, using an admissible but not particularly good heuristic might cost us here in the context of the 8 puzzle. So if it turns out that the depth of the solution for the 8 puzzle was at, uh, was at level 14, well, iterative deepening search would uh, uh, involve having something like uh, 3 million four hundred and something thousand nodes. A star with our H1 uh, 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 heuristic, that is the number of tiles out of place, is pretty good because it gets to the solution in only uh, five, with only uh, developing 539 nodes. But A star with our H2 algorithm, the total Manhattan distance, does it in 113 nodes. Well, what if the solution was at a depth of 24? Well, IDS, inter Iterative Deepening Search, was, is going to give something like 54 billion nodes to find the solution. And so I think uh, that you and I can agree that it's pretty clear that we're not going to be using Iterative Deepening Search to solve the 8 puzzle. And here, choice of heuristic actually does make a difference, because if we use H1, that is the uh, total number of tiles out of place, we're going to uh, expand something like close to 40,000 nodes to find the solution, whereas we pick the dominating uh, heuristic H2, the, Manhattan dis the total Manhattan distance, uh, we're only going to have to um, look at uh, about 1,600 nodes. Now, um, uh, what if you have uh, a heuristic that's uh, not uh, greater than another heuristic for all n? What do you do? Well, what you do is you combine them. So basically, if you've got two admissible heuristics, h sub a and h sub b, then you define uh, a heuristic function h sub n that takes the maximum of h of a sub n of, at, at node n and h of b at node n. And this new heuristic, h of n, is also admissible because uh, h of a and h of b were admissible, and it dominates both h of a and h of b. Now, when we're thinking about finding admissible heuristics, um, we can derive an, an admissible heuristic from an exact solution cost of a relaxed version of the problem. In other words, we find a simpler version of the problem and figure out what the actual cost of solving that simpler version would be. So, for instance, if the rules of the 8 puzzle are relaxed so a tile can move anywhere, then h of 1 uh, gives us a sort of solution because you could move uh, a tile directly from any position on the puzzle to any other position. That's exactly the shortest solution. And um, if the rules are relaxed so the tile can move to any adjacent square, regardless of whether or not there's a blank there, uh, the empty, empty uh, 
spaces there, then H2 of N gives a source solution. And, and the, really the takeaway here is that the optimal solution cost of a relaxed problem is no greater than the optimal solution cost of the real problem. And that, therefore, will give you an admissible heuristic. So, overall, today, um, uh, we looked at uh, uh, the rest of the uninformed searches and uh, uh, saw that the depth first search had low space cost but um, uh, possibly might not reach the solution and the solution there was to use iterative deepening search. And then we turned to um, informed search and we noted that heuristic functions estimate the cost of the shortest path. Um, it's pretty clear from our example of the eight puzzle that good heuristics can dramatically reduce search can dramatically reduce search cost. Now, we looked at two best first search searches. Uh, greedy best first search expands the lowest h. That is, it's the lowest cost from where we the node we are now to the goal, but it's incomplete and not always optimal. A star search instead expands the node with the lowest total cost uh, from the start space, start state through that node to the solution. And that's complete and optimal, and it's also optimally efficient. And uh, finally, we looked a little bit at admissibility and uh, noted that admissible heuristics can be derived from exact solutions of the last problem.